Julian Barber is a visiting professor of physics at the University of Oxford. He's the author of both The End of Time and The Discovery of Dynamics. My first question to you, Julian, would be, what is time? Time is something which we derive from change. And if you, I think you should distinguish two kinds of time. There are what I would call labels of time. These would be like dates, like today is whatever it is, the 5th of July. Uh, then, so that, that's just a mark, and we, we think of our life as, as passing through time, which we can label in one way or another. Then there's something which is much more precise and scientific, and that is duration. That is the time that is measured. And um, that is something to do with the dynamical laws which govern the universe, but ultimately all parts are governed by, by the dynamical laws which hold in the universe and we are discovering as time passes their form the first great step forward was with Newton and then the next one with Einstein and now we have quantum mechanics as well which tell us how to make uh, atomic clocks so th there's, there's a very big difference between just a, a, a label of time saying you know how we recognize events and, and sort of order them in our me memories and having a precise measure of duration. Now, in terms of is time an illusion, this is quite a contentious issue amongst philosophers and scientists. Some say that there genuinely is time and time is a duration. It's also a process of ordering structure. Some also say... <clears throat> because of space-time relativity under Einstein, that there is no absolute simultaneous events in the universe. So this now isn't really this now, and the future and the present all exist simultaneously. What are your views on this? Is time an illusion? And if it does exist, in what sense does it exist? I certainly don't think there is anything that one could call time which exists independently of the things in the universe and what they are doing. Uh, I do, uh, now let's, let's attack head on this issue of Einstein and the fact that you can't define simultaneity in accordance with this theory of relativity. Now, that is undoubtedly true and there's absolutely no question that there's vast amounts of confirmation of, of the structure of Einstein's theory, and it all points in uh, one direction, that there doesn't seem to be a unique way, certainly not if we're talking about experiments in the laboratory, there doesn't seem to be a unique way to define simultaneity. However, uh, Einstein's theory was developed for subsystems of the universe, basically what happens in, in laboratories, and he didn't really ever properly set up a theory of how the, the universe as a whole works in its entirety. And a lot of the work I've been doing in the last 10 years has tended to, has provided evidence that if you consider the whole universe, particularly if the universe is what they call spatially closed, that is, it closes up on itself in three dimensions, like the surface of the Earth does in two dimensions, then there does seem to be uh, a well-defined sense in which you can define a notion of simultaneity for the complete universe. It's you, you wouldn't be able to pick it up locally in the laboratory, but it, it is there in the universe. There, there seem, I think I would say there's now really quite strong evidence to support that and that it does play an important role in how the universe as a whole evolves. Now, for example, we see this in cosmology. Um, there is the famous microwave background, this... Um, heat bath of, of only below three degrees absolute that is throughout the whole universe and extraordinarily uniform to, to one part in 10,000. Um, now, this defines actually a standard of rest. We, uh, there is, uh, you can to quite a good accuracy say that you're at rest relative to this thing and at the same time to 
the average of all the galaxies in the universe. Now, this is not inconsistent with Einstein saying there's no notion of simultaneity, but it does show that we are in a, that the universe is in, from the point of view of Einstein's theory, in an extraordinarily special state. And my belief is that, but it's only a conjecture, as I say, it's a belief, uh, that this reflects the fact that for all that, there is a fundamental notion of simultaneity actually sitting at the heart of Einstein's theory. So that's to do with the question of whether there is simultaneity. And then this uh, changes the way, if this is confirmed, it will change the way we think about the universe because it will restore a unique sense of history to the universe. The, The thing that the lack of simultaneity does in Einstein's theory as it stands is remove the notion of a, of a unique history. Now, if I'm right, that that would be a unique history would be restored, and this is a very important part of a book, a, a book that's just come out by my friend Lee Smolin, in which he he argues that time is the primary thing, and that there is a notion of simultaneity. Now. He relies heavily on the work I've been doing with my collaborators, which we call Shape Dynamics. That's an, a very important part of his book. Now, I think he goes too far in claiming that time is the primary thing and that exists that it exists before anything else, because uh, in our work, the thing that comes first is is a configuration, or better, a shape of the universe. You could, to take the simplest model universe you possibly could, that would be just three particles in Euclidean space. So in any instant, those three particles would be, would form a triangle. And the picture that I have is that the history of the universe is just like a succession of those shapes of the triangle. Uh, You could imagine taking snapshots of each successive uh, triangle, uh, you can't, it doesn't meaningful to, it isn't meaningful to say how large that triangle is because you need some scale outside the universe to measure it by. And, And if we're saying the three particles are everything, then there is no external scale. So all you're left with is two angles which determine the shape of the triangle. Now that is clearly much more fundamental than the size of the triangle. We speak about the equilateral triangle, which means all of its sides have the same length. Uh, And that's something much more fundamental than its size. So uh, in my view, uh, you can talk of instants of time in this model universe, and the instant of time is just the shape that it has. And the shape changes. There's one shape after another. But that's the total reality as far as I'm concerned. It, it's just one shape following another. And that's what gives us the sense that time passes. If, if uh, When you open your eyes, close your eyes, you open your eyes again, and you look at a busy road, you, you see the cars moving. Mm. And, and you build up a sort of, you have a bit of a memory of what they were uh, before the instant before you're looking now. And it's from this that you get the idea that time passes. I mean, if uh, if absolutely nothing changed, you couldn't possibly say that time passes. So this is where I do disagree very fundamentally with Lee. Um, So for me, my fundamental concept, as I say, is a shape of the universe. And I would call that a now. I have no objection to saying there's an instant of time understood in this sense. It's it's just one such shape of the complete universe. Um, And but these things are defined by space and by matter within space. So for me, that is what comes first. And then time is something which emerges out of the changes of those things that exist in space. And this is where I disagree with with Smolin. Uh, So for me, there is no, in that sense, time is an illusion. There isn't there isn't any invisible river that is flowing or anything like that. What you see is what you get. I mean, you 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 
you see things changing and the things exist and the fact that they change is true and that's it. If I could just get you to clarify some points there. So essentially in the, the Lee Smolin perspective of time, that time is something that's constantly there in the backdrop that's universal. Is that akin to the old Newtonian version that time is absolute? Absolutely. Very much, yes. It's, it's very much like Newton. And in fact, it's very interesting. Newton in, in his Principia, in, there's a famous scolium where he, uh, at the start of his Principia, where he, he talks about absolute space and time. And Newton says quite explicitly that time would pass even if nothing changed in the universe. And that is really, I think, very close to Smolin's viewpoint. So I reject that aspect of, of Newton's claim, um, but I do restore his idea, I'm trying to restore his idea, that there is a notion of, of simultaneity throughout the universe. But that too is, the, to the extent that you can define it, it is thanks to the way the universe itself evolves. The universe doesn't need to evolve in that particular way which allows one to define a notion of simultaneity, but I think there's quite a lot of evidence that it does. Okay, Julia, and also with the aspect of simultaneity there, even though we can have simultaneity throughout the universe, you're essentially arguing that's only because of the configurations of shapes in the universe, which then leads to this perception of time, not because time itself is universal. Yes, that's right. Yes. And, and key for this argument that simultaneity exists is that you look at the, the complete universe and, and the shape it takes. Uh, there is definitely a sense in which you can say, uh, in accordance with Einstein's theory, it's sitting right inside the mathematics of Einstein's theory, that there is some uniquely defined sense in which there is one shape of the universe following another. And this obviously ties into why it's about the configuration of shapes per se and the idea of motion instead of time itself. That's right, yes. I would say change or differences. I mean, there is this very interesting fact that uh, formally the equations of both Newton and Einstein, the laws take exactly the same form uh, in either time direction. So the, the way this actually plays out is if you have an initial configuration of the particles in Newtonian theory and you give them certain velocities, then you get a certain evolution. The, the, uh, the configuration of the particles changes in a very precise way. However, if you go back to the start and have the same positions of the particles, but exactly reverse all the uh, particles, uh, the velocities, they will go off and have a different evolution, but they will be evolving in, in accordance with exactly the same laws. So that if one gave the same, that, that evolution to those two evolutions to two mathematicians, they couldn't say, ah, oh, this is going in the wrong time direction. It's, it's, it's very, it's very interesting property that of, of Newton's theory. No, and obviously what you've also been saying there about, um, shape configuration, that's sitting at the heart of Einstein's theory and it's still, as you just elaborated there, still tied in with aspects of relativity. Y yes, yeah. Okay. Now, just on a different track slightly, how do the notions of time, whether it's yours or Lee Smoland or others in the field, how do they become more problematic or perhaps more clear when we look at the difference at quantum physics and the, the macro picture of general relativity? Is, is this a problem? Is it a valid problem? Or is it something that we can still separate the two? Essentially, how does time operate differently at these levels? Well, I think the first thing you can say is that... Uh, all attempts to unify quantum mechanics with general relativity and thereby obtain some description of the whole universe, they, none of these have got anywhere near a definitive success at the moment. In fact, I would say there has been extremely little progress has been made. Uh, and this is the reason now why there are a 
huge range of uh, opinions about what time is. I mean, I think it, it, it might not be an, an exaggeration to say 